Good evening and welcome to Discover the Joy. I'm Paul Harrell and we're so very thankful that you're letting us be a part of your lives tonight. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 20, verse 34. Luke chapter 20, verse 34. That's where Mom's going to be teaching from tonight. If you don't have a Bible, please feel free to call that number that you'll see throughout the show and we will send you a Bible. We pay the shipping and handling on them. Well, they look a lot like this right here. This will be the Bible that you'll get. So if you want a Bible, please call that number. The same number is also for prayer. We'd love to pray with you. Now listen to Mom. We're so glad to be back with you this evening, and uh, we just counted a privilege uh, to be able to study God's Word. I hope some of you are regulars, that you come back each week, and you got your Bible, and you looking forward to finishing the book of Luke with us. We've been in the book of Luke for uh, all about a year now because we're doing a verse-by-verse study, and we just have this period of time on Sunday night, we, I was talking with uh, earlier with some of our people that work here with the uh, Discover the Joy Ministry. Uh, we're here for no other reason other than to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. And if you happen to have come flip channels and you've stopped for a minute on Channel 25 tonight, that's not uh, just by chance. And I don't believe it was just an accident. I believe the Holy Spirit led you uh, to Channel 25 tonight to discover the joy as we're going to share God's Word. I, my prayer and the prayer of, of uh, the staff here at Discover the Joy is that God speaks to you personally through His Word. Oh, you won't hear an audible voice, but you will hear Him through His Word. You will, it will speak to your heart, and you know that God is touching your heart. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and get started tonight in our study. Father, we just come to you again, praising you as God Almighty. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it just reveals the plan that you have for mankind. Father, I thank you that Jesus Christ was willing to pay our sin debt at Calvary. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And it's a free gift, and because it's free and it was such a, an awesome thing that he did, I think it's hard for some of us to accept that that's all it has to be, so we think we have to work and do something extra. And Father, we, we should, after we're saved, want to serve you, but there's nothing we can do to acquire salvation other than placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Tonight, Father, I pray that you speak to us through your word. Father, you're the author of the book. It's your word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, last week, Paul mentioned we're going to start with verse 34. And as I was closing last week, uh, the section that we were addressing uh, began with verse 27, actually. And it was about some Sadducees had... Uh, come up and they were questioning Jesus. They gave him a question. It's the same question that they used many times with the Pharisees. Sadducees, this group of Sadducees, these religious leaders, they did not believe in, a resur in the resurrection. The Pharisees did believe in the resurrection, but they did not believe in the resurrection as Jesus taught the resurrection. See, they believed that the resurrection would just be an extension of life as we know it right now. Well, once the resurrection occurs and we have that glorified body, uh, we're, those of us that have gone on in death will be reunited with that and we'll be given that glorified body and others that are changed in the moment and twinkling of an eye will have the glorified body, something we cannot even imagine. But my, number one is it'll be sinless. And that's something we've never really experienced. Once we're saved, we're cleansed of our sins, but yet we still battle this old sin nature, this old body we live in. But <clears throat> they, these Sadducees knew that Jesus believed in the resurrection. And they were trying to trap him. They were giving him a loaded question, as the Pharisees did often. And they had stumped 
some of the Pharisees with this same question before. And what they had said was that uh, in verse 29, now there was a woman, uh, in other words, a brother married, one, there were seven brothers, one married a woman, and he, the first husband died and left her childless. Well, if you go back over into the law, the old law, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5, teaches about this, that if if uh, a member of a family, a male member, and he if he died and he left his widow without any children, well, it was the duty of another brother in the family to marry her and give her a child because children, not only were they a great heritage, which today we have forgotten that. We're to, we, we've gone to the other extreme. As a nation now, we have legalized abortion, killing children where... Uh, God says they're a heritage. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, there was no uh, welfare system. There was no social security system. So when a woman was left without uh, her husband, her sons would help support her and take care of her. But anyway, it goes on to, t to say that in verse 30, the second uh, married and then the third married the same woman, and each time she did not have any children. And verse 33, it says, Now then at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? And this was supposed to be a loaded question, some way to trap Jesus, because the Pharisees knew what Deuteronomy 25 had said, but they still did not believe as the Sadducees. Sadducees just did not even believe in the resurrection. But Jesus replied, beginning in our verse 34 tonight, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. Well, see, when we are resurrected bodies, there will be no death. So there would be no reason for someone else having to marry uh, a widow. And there would be not, there's no reason for procreation. There's no reason to keep having children because if we're saved, when we go to heaven, and even later when the resurrection occurs and we're given that uh, glorified body, we're going to live forever. We will never, ever die. And <clears throat> so that's what Jesus is trying to explain, not only to the Sadducees, but also to the Pharisees who just in their minds thought, the resurrection would be an extension of what we know now. And, and then it says uh, in the last part of verse 36, they are God's children since they are children of the resurrection. I'm going to tell you, I, am, I'm, I was proud to be called my dad's daughter, to be a part of the Chester family when, <clears throat> before I married. Uh, but the greatest... The greatest thing is that I'm a child of God. I am a daughter of God. And if you've been saved, you're a child of God, a son or a daughter of God. Nothing ever, nothing can compare to that. But in, the, uh, <clears throat> in verse 37, but in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. So... Jesus is pointing out to these Sadducees there is a resurrection. They all respected, they called him Father Abraham. They all respected Abraham, their ancestor. Uh, but Jesus is pointing out Moses believed in the resurrection. He addressed, at the burning bush, he addressed God, the Lord, as the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, those who had gone on before. And I love verse 40, uh, 38. It says, He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. I'm going to tell you, if you've been saved, you are guaranteed eternal life with God in heaven. If you're not saved, you will have eternal life, but it will be an eternal damnation in hell. Today, we most of our preachers don't even want to talk about hell. There is a hell as sure as there is a heaven. In fact, Jesus warned more of hell than he 
talked about heaven, trying to keep people from going there. He did everything he could. He died at Calvary for me and for you. But it says, He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. I'll just go back to a couple of years ago when Jim, my husband, passed away. And some of you that have watched the show, you knew him because uh, Discover the Joy was started when, when he uh, preached and taught on the show. And I'm just teaching uh, from the Bible now. But one thing I like to think of, after he passed away, Jim and everyone else who knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are more alive today than they've ever been. When we're in the presence of God, we will experience uh, a life, real life, that was meant for us from the beginning. So when he says he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, yes, those who are dead, who died, the physical bodies are dead, but the spiritual being, the person we really know, are, is living on with God, and they're more alive than they've ever been before. And then verse 39 it says, Some of the teachers of the law responded, and they said, Well said, teacher. And no one dared to ask any more questions. See, often, if we, as we've studied in the book of Luke for some time, have you noticed how many times that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and the different ones, they would try to trick Jesus by asking him questions. And most of the time, after Jesus answered the question, he would turn it around and he would ask them a question. He would make them think. You know, sometimes if we think harder when someone does quit, they present something to us in the form of a question because we know we have to think about it, how we're going to respond, how we're going to answer. And um, so they responded, well said, teacher, because they didn't know anything else to say. They realized that uh, that wasn't exactly what they wanted to hear, but they had no rebuttal to come back to Jesus. They still did not have the picture. They still did not understand that the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the Son of God, stood right in their very midst and they were talking to him. Then in verse 41, then Jesus said to them, now Jesus is going to turn the tables and ask them another question that is going to go right to the heart of the matter. He says, then Jesus said, how is it that they say the Christ is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And then in verse 44, David calls him Lord. How can he be his son? That is an actual quote where it says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. That is an actual quote from Psalms 110, verse 1. And Jesus knew that these religious people, and just for a reminder, I've said it many times, and maybe there's some new people listening tonight, religion is everything that man does to reach God. But Christianity is everything that God has done to reach us through Jesus Christ. So they were very religious, but yet they were stumbling over their very salvation in Jesus Christ. See, Abraham, Isaac, King David, they were all very, very respected by these Jewish leaders. And they had been dead for many years, these, the one, but... They knew from the Old Testament and the scripture they had that the Christ, the Messiah, would come from the lineage of David. And that's the reason Jesus chose Psalms 110 verse 1 to quote to them. He says, the Lord, and that's speaking of God, the, it says the Lord, and that speaks of God the Father, said to my Lord, capital L again, speaking of Jesus Christ, who David is speaking of also. And then God says to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And that day is coming. 
And so Jesus has drawn a picture here. He has shown them that someone they really respected, King David, acknowledged that the Messiah would be both human and deity. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ was and he is. He was the Son of God, deity, and yet he took on flesh and he's also called the Son of Man. David, King David knew that. He is acknowledging that in Psalms 110, that he knew that the Messiah, when he came, would come from his lineage because God had promised that to him. We read that last week or the week before. God said that, that there will be a king that will come that will sit on the throne forever, and it's going to come through you, and, and you can trace the lineage of Jesus Christ, Mary, and even Joseph back through David. And so he says, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, and that day has not come, but that day is coming. There are a lot of enemies of Jesus Christ today. People do not respect or even acknowledge the fact that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Lord. In fact, um, I was shocked today. Uh, I was at work and a friend showed me a Facebook page of a young man and I, I would say he's no more than in the seventh or eighth grade and he says that he's an atheist, an agnostic. Do you know how dangerous that is for our young people to take a stand like that? We, they're opening themselves up to the dark, evil spirit world. And you give Satan a toehold, he will take a foothold and he'll ultimately build a stronghold. But that's where we are today. So what Jesus is telling these people, and the, the issue is the same tonight as I'm talking to you. There is a central issue when it comes to, people call it religion, but when it comes to eternal life. See, you can be, there's a lot of different religions, but <clears throat> unless the matter of who Jesus Christ was and is is settled in your heart that you've accept, accepted him as Lord and Savior, that religion will never, ever never last. And see, today, so many people, they say, well, I believe that there's a God by the creation and things that I have witnessed. But now, Jesus, I believe, was a good teacher, or he was a good uh, prophet. Jesus was more than a prophet. Jesus was more than a teacher. Jesus was, and he is, the Son of God. He is God. And everything else pales until we get that issue settled, until we settle the matter of who Jesus Christ is. And we're living dangerously today because the name of Jesus, even in America, and I didn't think I would live to see it, but I have, the name of Jesus is not respected and in many and in many places it is not even allowed to be used. Well then the ver <clears throat> the chapter goes on in verse 45 and it says while all the people were listening Jesus said to his disciples beware of the teachers uh, of the law they like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. And then verse 47, they devour uh, widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. I mentioned a while ago that religion is everything that man does to reach God. And it's not going, in the end, it, it's, when this life comes to an end, that's not going to matter one bit. It's only what we've accepted by faith that Jesus Christ has done for us. But these verses I just read, that's religion 
at its worst. The scribes used the, uh, their religion to advance their own ambitions. They wanted to be well respected. They were, they were hypocrites. Uh, that's the reason they like to pray out on the street corners and in the word of God, Jesus said, go into your closet and pray. You have that time with you and God alone. But they wanted everyone to hear their flowery uh, prayers. They had their long robes. They wanted to have the best seats in the synagogue. They, uh, they weren't on the back row. They were up front because they felt their importance. I wish today we could get more people up front just because they were hungry to hear the word of God. And <clears throat> they also took advantage of widows. And in the Old Testament, that was definitely uh, a, a, a sin. In Exodus 22, chapter 22, verse 22 through 23, uh, they were told to take care of the widows and the orphans. And instead of them doing that, they took advantage of them. And uh, so they, they like to strut around and act very important. I like, uh, I was in a Bible study one time and a friend of mine said, well, you know, today a peacock and tomorrow a feather duster. So that's exactly right. That's what happened to them and will to any of us that think we're more important than what we should be. Now we're going to look at uh, chapter 21 of Luke. And... <clears throat> We're going to find that a widow gives all she has, beginning with verse 1. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Well, see, the widow at the temple was the picture of what a true follower of God should look like. And then the scribes and the Pharisees, they were definitely a picture, but it was a picture of false religion. And so Jesus praised her. He picked her out of all the ones that were coming by and dropping their uh, money and their offerings in. And actually this was what the place in the temple that was called the women's court because the women weren't always allowed to go uh, in, excuse me, to the synagogue like uh, the men. And, but in the women's court, the women could gather and there was the receptacle that was there for everyone to drop their offerings in. And Jesus watched, and him being God, he knew exactly what this dear lady had. She had nothing. She was a widow. She had no way to work. She had no way to make any money. And apparently she had two coins left. And she did something that was, that touched the heart of Jesus. Jesus always and still is compassionate. He loves us with a love that we can never really fathom. Uh, he loved us enough to die for us, but there's never a tear that we cry. There's never a dark valley that we go through. There's never a problem that he does not know about and he does not care how it's affecting us, and he wants us to bring him those things and allow him then quit trying to fix it ourselves and allow him to work. And he knew this dear lady. She didn't have, she gave what she had. See, when some of these wealthy, rich scribes came by, and let's say they gave a tenth that particular day in, in the offering to the, to the temple there. That didn't mean their bank account was depleted. They just gave a tenth of their wealth. What this little widow lady did, she gave all she had and there was nothing left, but she gave it all to the Lord. And Jesus points this out to those who are standing around and listening. And he says that she didn't give a gift 
out of her abundance. She gave her gift, and when she gave it, there was nothing left. But you know what? She placed her trust in God Almighty. And I will promise you when we do that, He will take care of us. He doesn't promise us that He'll give us all of our wants, but He does say that He'll take care of our needs. He says, well, look at the little sparrows. They don't worry and toil and get frantic when you think the bank account is going to be depleted. No, they know that their Heavenly Father will take care of them. And we need to learn today that God has promised, and He is a promise-keeping God. What He says He will do, He does. Throughout the Word of God, we've seen that. We're seeing it take place, prophecy taking place over and over. I will testify to you. I have seen the times when I gave, when I wasn't for sure, how I was going to get the rest of the month met far as uh, financially. And you know God has never, ever let me down. The reason he allows us sometimes not to have as much is that he can show his self great in our meager circumstances. I love it when I... I think about this, and sometimes some of you all have called, and I like to, if you ask for prayer, maybe for a financial need, and I, I love to pray with you about that. Because, see, I know my Heavenly Father. The Word says He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But, see, as His child, I know He owns the hills that the cattle stand on. And He's promised to take care of our needs. You know, He's never... Late, he's never early, but he'll always be right on time. See, today we live in such a hurry up, microwave society. We want everything. We want to know how it's going to be done for years ahead. To exercise faith, we have to trust not only from day to day, but from moment to moment. Trusting God that he is going to lead us. You know, since Jim's been gone, I've been able to know that God, and I praise him that he's been the shep my shepherd all the days of my life. He has been with me. He has supplied every need. He's been my comfort. He's been my joy. His grace and mercy knows no boundaries. I hope tonight... If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you'll just bow your head right now and it just confess that you are a sinner, that you cannot save yourself, and that you believe that Jesus Christ died in your place at Calvary and ask him to come into your heart. He's faithful. He will save you tonight and you will experience joy.